Generations Church, welcome. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 15? We're going to pick up uh, part of that story that we just heard read to us. And what's going on, as you just heard read, is that God has called Saul, the king, to go in and and conquer and push out the Amalekites, a a very wicked people, known for their sin, known for their child sacrifice, all kinds of incredible things. And so Saul goes in, and God tells him, listen, get rid of all of them, man, woman, child, animal, everything, just kill everything. And I know it's a, a very challenging thing to hear, but what God is doing is saying, I want to rid the world of that problem so that as Israel expands into that area, they won't be tempted to follow in the idolatrous and and evil practices of the Amalekites. Now, what Saul does is he goes in and he displaces, he kills almost all the people and almost all the animals, but he keeps some. And this is where we pick up our story with God saying, listen, you didn't do what I said to do. You did as much as you wanted to do. You didn't do everything I told you to do. You did as much as you wanted to do. I wanted to take this way out of this because we don't really have a circumstance like that where we go in and kill a group of people, and I hope that's not what's going on today. But let me tie this to a modern-day church practice of tithing. Of course, a biblical practice, Old Testament, New Testament, tithing. The idea behind tithing is that God calls us to give our first tenth, right, tithe, our first tenth of our income to the ministry, to the church, right? Now, imagine that you see people, and this is very common, people will take and they get an income and they get their paycheck and, and then they pay their house payment and they pay their electric bill and they pay their cell phone. They set aside some money for food and, oh yeah, I need this much so I can go to Starbucks every day and here's where I am. And then what's left over, well, I will give of that to God. I'll give some of what I have left over, I'll give that to God. And what we're doing when we do that is rather than taking what God says and doing what God calls us to and trusting him for everything else, instead, We're doing what we want. We're picking and choosing where we're obedient to God. Are we still giving? Sure. Maybe we're giving the same amount. Maybe it's different. Who knows? But are we doing everything God calls us to do? Saul goes into the land, and he kills most of the Amalekites, most of their animals, not all. And this is where God says, listen, you're not being obedient to me. I'm going to give you a main idea today. A new king for God's people. God removes Saul, a failed king, and provides hope through David. Through this, God points forward to a new king in Jesus who provides hope for the world. Today, we get our hope kind of foreshadowed through a new king, something we need in America. We need new hope. We need a new king. We need to focus on the true king, Jesus. And so we'll see that in the story today. 1 Samuel 15, we're going to pick up right after what you'd heard, read in verse 17. It says, and Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Saul, here's your job. Go, fight the Amalekites. Now, I want you to hear what God didn't say. Like God, God didn't tell Saul, go in and try and accomplish overcoming them. God said, I'll deliver them into your hand. I will give you victory. You don't have to worry about victory. You have to worry about obedience, right? Go in, displace them, kill them, get rid of their idolatrous, evil, child-sacrificing ways. Get rid of that and just kill everything. Like, let's just start fresh. It's, it's ugly. I know it's, it's painful. It's like kind of a, a First Samuel version of the, the flood in Genesis. I know it, it's a brutal way of hearing this, but God is trying to rid the world of a specific evil. And so this is what God calls Saul to do. Saul doesn't do it. Now, I want to tie this into kind of the gospel message that we talk about all the time. We talk about the the gospel in terms of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. God created us. He designed us, made us, right? Here's how we are to be. God knows how we are to be. We are to be worshipers of God. We choose to do anything other we sin, fall, right? We, we fall into sin. Now, we're born in sin. We also contribute to sin. So there's creation, fall, redemption, Jesus, right? The gospel, restoration, how we live on the other side of being transformed and transforming by Jesus. And so here we have this creation kind of part where Saul, here's what you're commanded to do. You're to go in to wipe out all the Amalekites, but he doesn't. Here's the job you were given, but he didn't do it. Kind of like Adam in the garden, God says this, 
God says to Adam, like, listen, here's everything created for you. Everything is yours. Everything is good. Don't eat that one thing in the middle. That will kill you, right? Everything is good. Go do this. I'll empower you. I give it to you. Same thing to Saul. Listen, I will give you victory, but you got to take everybody out. That's the deal. There's a way you and I are made to be. We're made to be worshipers of God. That's our design. And in that, that's where we, we strive to be as Christians. We strive to be worshipers of God. What that means is that, that our lives will bring glory to God, that our lives will focus on Jesus, make ourselves about Jesus. As we live the lives that we're called to live and we work and we play and we do, that we will do so for the glory of Jesus. That's our created purpose. Verse 19, Samuel continues speaking to Saul. He says, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me. I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So many things go wrong here. First off, the Lord your God, not the Lord my God, the Lord Samuel's God. Like you just hear Saul's distance from his God, right? And then he says this too, Saul blames everyone else. Like, listen, I was going along with exactly what God said, but then he even admits, I didn't kill the king, right? I brought him here. But then he blames everybody else. He says, you know, they wanted to keep the best of the animals. Now, Saul, instead of being a king, being an, like kind of owning the fact that he is the leader shifts the blame to the people. Just so many things go wrong here. And then you even hear like how disconnected he is from God. Verse 22, and Samuel said, how has the, has the Lord as great delight in, sorry, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Sin is choosing what we obey, right? Sin is saying, here's what God has said. Here's what God has decreed. Here's the law that God has given us. Here's the, the commandments, the rules. Here's the way we're made to be. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to self-select what those things, I, I think I want to obey this, and, but I don't really like this, right? That's sin, choosing, because what that does is it puts me, you, us, in the place of God. Rather than God saying, Here's what's right or wrong. Here's what's best for you. Here's how life works. Here's how you're created. Here's how you function the best. Instead of saying, okay, God, I hear you, but you sit down. I'm going to be God. I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose what's best for me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to not do that. And here's what I'm going to do. And, and ultimately, that's sin. Here's a note for you. I want to give this to you. Obedience is doing all that God commands not just what is convenient, right? Obedience to God is what God desires. He doesn't desire big sacrifices and big shows and gestures of, of whatever. He desires obedience, and obedience is following everything that God calls us to. Now, we know we're flawed, we're broken. We know that we don't do everything that God calls us to. That is obedience, though. That doesn't mean we make excuses for what we don't do. Obedience is striving to do all that God has commanded us to, and that we would submit to all that God has called us to, that we would rise to the challenge of being the people that God has called us and created us to be. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and the presumption as iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So because you rejected what God called you to do, he's rejecting you as king right? Here's what you were created. You were called to be king. You had the job. You were here. Humanity, you had the job. You already were obedient, but you chose to sin. Now, here's the implications of your sin. It's called the fall, right? As sin enters in and corrupts humanity, we have a fall. The result of human sin is the broken world we live in, right? We're in the middle of a struggle through a pandemic, right? Where people have gotten sick, people have died, right? Death is a reality in a virus, in the pandemic, right? Death is the result of sin. That doesn't mean that somebody sinned and they got the virus. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not true, but I don't, most 99.999% chances, it just happens. It isn't a direct result of something we do wrong. We just get it, like the flu or cancer or something else. But death is the result sometimes. Death is the result of a broken, flawed, sinful world. There was no 
virus, pandemic, sickness, or death before sin entered into human history, right? As we get that, we also inherit death. Kind of think cancer. You may be genetically predisposed to cancer. You also might do something that causes cancer. If you smoke all your life, you're likely to get lung cancer. Sometimes it's the result of something we do. Most of the time, it's the result of living in a world filled with sin, a, a world you and I contribute sin to. It's not like we're innocent of this. We also add sin to the world. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Here is the penalty. Saul is no longer going to be king. Now, it doesn't mean he's removed from office today. It is a prediction of what God is doing, that God is taking the kingdom from Saul and his family, right? That Jonathan, his son, will not grow up to be king, that another family will take over. And so, Saul, uh, so Samuel, the prophet, tells him, listen, you are no longer to be king. Imagine this, if, if you are a spouse who is unloving or unfaithful, a bad spouse, can, can God forgive you of that sin, and will you still go to heaven? Well, yeah, of course, right? Of course that's true. We know that we can be forgiven of sin, but let me ask you another question. Can you be an unloving, unfaithful spouse? Can you cheat or, or be unfaithful or lie or do whatever's wrong and, and repeatedly do that, and then you could be forgiven by God. We already answered that, but then are you guaranteed to have that relationship still? Are you still guaranteed to have a wife or a husband that loves you and forgives you? And are you, maybe will you lose that family? And, and of course, we know the answer is yes. You might deserve to lose the family even if God forgives you eternally. And the idea here is that sin has implications. Sin, sin causes repercussion. There are things in this world that you do that, that, that cause an outcome. You're unfaithful to a spouse. You may lose that marriage. You are a bad f parent. You may lose that child, right? If you do things in this life, there are natural repercussions. Even, even it can be spiritual repercussions, but that doesn't mean that forgiveness or salvation is always what we're talking about, that obedience or disobedience has consequences. They may not be heaven or hell. They may be right now, but there's still consequences. Verse 29 says, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, Samuel continues, for he is not a man that he should have regret. And then he said, I have sinned. So Saul says, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may be that I may bow, bow before the Lord your God. Here's what happens. He sins, we know that. He loses something eventually, we know that. But in this moment, he wants Samuel the prophet to stand by him. He wants to go and bow before him. He wants to worship God. He wants to go and do this and and he, really Here's what we hear. He wants God's best still, even though he has fallen short. I want to put this verse up here, 1 Samuel 15, 9. We read this earlier. It says, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen of the fattened calves and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So here's what happens. They go into the land of the Amalekites and they kill most of the Amalekites. Not all, most. And then they kill all the animals that don't look great. They don't look good to eat. They don't look good to breed. They, they kill the ones that they think, well, let's just kill these. The problem is they keep the ones that look good. These are the ones that look good to eat. These are the ones that look good to breed. We want to keep these. These ones will come for, well, we can sell them for a good price. And here's really what happens is when we do this, we do kind of a similar thing. We want the best of this world and we want the best from God. And when God says, I want you to give me all, I want you to give me my obedience, and we choose to try and get the best out of what we think is right here, and we want the best from God, we lose one way or the other. 
right? We, we lose that sense of obedience, right? Now, what we find out is when we follow God and we get God's best, his best is better than what this world offers. But here's where we fall short. Here's where we, as human beings, we always tend to fall short. We want the best of this world, but we also want the best from God. Now, what we think is the best from this world isn't always our best. But we chase after the things we can see. We chase after the money. We chase after, in their case, they chase after the animals, the, the herds, the cattle, the sheep. I'll put this note on the screen for you. We want God to give us his best without giving up what we think is best from this world. God calls us to choose him alone. God chooses, God calls us to choose to release what might look good here, to give up what might be appealing here and trust him that what his plan is, is best, that what he offers us is greatest. We tend to try and strive for living in both scenarios. We want the best in what we can see, and yet we want God's best too. Here's what Saul does. He fails in obeying God, but then he still wants Samuel to walk back and stand by him. He still wants to be able to go back and bow and worship God. He's not giving up this world, but he still wants what God wants to give, what, what he wants God to give him. Verse 31. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. And Samuel said, bring me here, uh, Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death, death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Samuel goes, just finishes the job, right? He goes and hacks Agag. He kills this king. I'm guessing some days it had its benefit to be the prophet, right? You need to take your aggressions out on the king, right? Actually, what Samuel does is he follows up and he does what Saul should have done, what should have been done on the battlefield where it makes sense when you're at war and you just do, the, the killing happens. But instead, because Saul was unfaithful, Samuel literally has to finish the job for him. And he kills the king of the Amalekites, putting an end to that group of people. Verse 34, then Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, the regret of God, it said earlier that God doesn't, is not a human, that he has regrets, but then it says he regrets making Saul king. And, and, and here's what you need to hear. When God stoops down to reveal himself to us, right? That, that God is, is greater than our understanding or our abilities to comprehend God. God is bigger than our understanding. And so God kind of stoops down, if you will. He, he condescends or lowers himself to us that we might understand. And he does so in ways that we can relate to. And sometimes God will give us something that has the exact same meaning, like God is our father, like God created us, made us, cares for us, loves us, desires us as a father would. Sometimes he uses feelings like jealousy or regret. And when we hear those things, we have regrets. Typically, we regret doing something because someone failed or because we fell short. If, I, if I'm jealous of something, there's a problem, right? Or regret. God doesn't regret because God made a wrong decision. That's what the earlier verse was saying. But God wants us to hear the pain and the emotion that God endures as Saul, Saul falls short as a leader. And it just causes us to ask this question like, what might I do or be doing or, or do in the past, do in the future, whatever it might be, that would cause God that kind of sensation of regret, like, like I wish I hadn't entrusted him or her to do this job. Now, we know God knows that he knows the beginning from the end. We know that God knows how it will play out. So we know we're not catching God by surprise, but he wants us to understand the emotion, the feeling behind when we let him down, when we do what we're not supposed to do, or we don't do what we're called to do, that sense of regret is the way he chooses to explain it. Verse six, or so First Samuel sixteen, verse one. The Lord said to Samuel, "How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send to you Jesse the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons." Samuel is grieving Saul. He's grieving that this leader 
didn't do what a leader should have done, that he didn't become the man that he could have been, that, that God had set him up to be something amazing. Kind of just take yourself and just, as we watch the world we live in, and maybe there's somebody we love who just struggles with an addiction or struggles with a, a, a challenge in their life, and, and they're just, we want so much more for them. We know God wants so much more for them, and it's painful to sit on the sidelines and know that, like, I can't fix this. I have this in my life. I have a friend who just can't get through an addiction, and, and he's paying the penalty for it right now, and, and my heart aches for him. I, I long for him, and, and I know that that's his choice, and I, I get that. But Samuel is saying, man, Saul, he had it all. He was king of God's people. God allowed him to lead, and he dropped the ball. So God says, listen, I want you to grab your horn of oil. I want you to grab this. I have chosen another king. I'm going to send this family to you, and you're going to anoint the next king. And again, there's a different setting, almost kind of like we went through an election, and when the vote is over, and I know this was this is a bad example because the vote was so weird and the counting was so weird this last time. But normally, in normal times, right, the vote's over, we have a clear winner, and then maybe a month later, they get sworn into office. And that, that's kind of common, right? Well, this is going to be similar. It's going to be an, an anointing. God has made a decision, but it will be many years later that David will become king. This is this kind of this point where in between where there's hope, right? God is pointing forward from Saul, the broken setting, to David, the future king who will be called the friend of God and love God and lead the people to new heights, to new places. Now, David's imperfect, but what's going on here is this shift towards hope, just like the gospel. When we find ourselves being that broken person like Saul, when we find ourselves in the problem where we've created the problem, there's still hope. God still gives us hope. We know that Jesus has come. He's lived. He's died. He's rose again. We know that inside that gospel that he gave his life for our sin, that his resurrection gives us new life and, and energy, a power, if you will, from God to live in new ways. Again, use my friend with uh, struggling with addiction, right? That God has given us the ability to overcome addiction, that in Christ, filled with his spirit, that we have the ability to live in new ways, that we have, again, the empowering to be different people. So we have that hope. We know the hope of the gospel. And as we see this shift from Saul to David, it's really God pointing forward through the line of David to Jesus that gives us true hope. Because David is human. David is flawed. David's a king. He'll be a good king, but he has some deep flaws too. It isn't our hope in a better version of the last thing. And again, back to our presence, it isn't a hope in a better version of the last one. It's our hope in Christ ultimately that keeps us with eyes that look forward and long for what God has for us. Humans will always let us down. Christ is the eternal king. So we look forward. And it's going to tie us through the line of David to this. Verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you will do and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So Samuel has an honest question. Hey, if I go anoint another king, Saul's gonna kill me or kill the other king, right? How do I do this? Now, God is calling Samuel to go do something hard. Samuel's like, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient. Unlike Saul, I'm going to be obedient. How do I do it? How do I do this so that it works? God gives him a plan. Here's what you're going to do. Now Samuel does it. Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, do you come peaceably? Now, just pause for just a second. Samuel is the prophet of God. Like he comes and he, he speaks on behalf of God. That's probably terrifying enough. But remember, he just murdered a man and chopped him into pieces because God said so. So he comes to your town, you might have questions, right? Verse five, he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves or clean yourselves up, set yourselves apart and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. There's this invitation for the sons to come and worship with him. He's inviting this family, this man named Jesse. If you're in community groups right now, you probably just this last week went through the curriculum on Ruth. 
Ruth tells us this story of a Moabite woman who marries into a, a Jewish family who returns back to Israel, a Hebrew family returns back to Israel. And in this, she comes back, but her husband has died, and her mother-in-law comes back with her Naomi. She comes back, and she gleans in the fields, and you probably know the story of Ruth, right? And, and Ruth meets Boaz, this kinsman redeemer, this redeemer of a family. And what happens is he is an amazing guy who ends up marrying Ruth and, and providing for her and caring for her and carrying on the lineage that belongs to this family. They have a man named Jesse. Jesse is here. It's Jesse's sons that we're going to see in this passage, right? And so we see how these books in our community group and this, how they kind of weave together. That's why I encourage you, please be a part of a community group. We're doing things that help us understand more of what we're talking about. So Jesse and his sons are invited to the sacrifice. Verse 6, and when they came, he looked on Eliab and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. In other words, he sees the oldest son. He's like, clearly that's the guy, right? Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on his heart. Remember how they chose Saul, right? There was this man from a wealthy family who was tall and good looking. He was a head taller, he said, from the shoulders upward than everybody else. And he was good looking from a wealthy family. And Samuel falls into this too. He gets there and he sees Jesse and he sees his firstborn son, which is a likely candidate, and a tall, good-looking man. He says, hey, that's got to be it. And God says this. He says, no, that's not him. He says, because I choose people differently, because I look inside a man, because I look to a heart. Right? See, the good news of the gospel is no matter how tall you are or what you look like, you can be godly. It's good for me, not a tall guy, right? So there's the good news. It doesn't matter what you look like or the family you come from. It doesn't matter how educated you are or your background. It doesn't matter. And I say that and I joke, but again, my story is true. My background is terrible. But still, you can find yourself in Christ. You can be a man after God's heart, no matter what your background is. No matter how you started, it matters how you finish. God's not looking on the outside. He's looking at the heart. God desires obedience. Now, that's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of being in Christ. But here's the bad news. You can try and look good on the outside like you're deeply obedient and worshipful and love Jesus. But in your heart, you can be far away and not be in Christ. See, the warning of the gospel is it's not what it looks like on the outside. It doesn't matter if you show up and you, you look fancy and you come to church and you serve and give. and do, It doesn't matter who you love on the inside. Where your heart is on the inside is what matters. That is both the good news and the bad news today. The, the good news is it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from, how much money you have or how smart you are. It matters that you love Jesus. The warning is Tr not trying to clean up the outside thinking that's what matters, but really to do that business, that work on the heart, that our hearts will be 110% sold out for Jesus. Verse 8. You know what? I want to read that verse again. That just is so good. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Verse 7, that second half of verse 7, the man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I can't emphasize this more. Your heart is what matters. It's our hearts. I'm broken in my heart more than I am on the outside. Also, the work done, the gospel hits my heart, not necessarily the outside. That's the good news, though. No matter where you come from, your heart, your heart can be fixed. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, so the next oldest son, right? And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, the next oldest son. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made the seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down till he comes here. Why do we get so many things wrong? Like you can just imagine Samuel sitting over Jesse, and Jesse's like, it's got to be my oldest. Like, that guy's a stud. He's got to be it, right? Not him. All right, let's try the second oldest. It's got to be him. And he gets through, literally gets through these 10 sons, and none of them are there. 
He keeps passing by, and, and Samuel's like, nope, that's not it. That's not it. I don't know. God says, no, I don't know what to do. Is there any others? He's like, there is, but you don't want him. I mean, like, there's David, but he's the shepherd one. He's the youngest. You don't re- do you really want that guy? And Samuel says, go get him. And again, I just, it's that same thing. We look through this human lens. And in, in this culture back then, it was really the primacy went to the oldest. The, the oldest was the best choice always. They always defaulted to the oldest. And now we're looking down at this young son, a nobody. He's a kid. He hasn't done anything really right or wrong. He's done nothing. He's just a kid. He's out taking care of the sheep at this point. But that's the one God's looking for. Because inside of David's heart is a heart that loves God. And it's not that these other guys weren't great. Maybe they were great, but they were not the one God was looking for. Verse 12, and he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy, and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So David comes, and they anoint David king. God says, this is the one. Samuel goes and anoints him. And this beautiful story, and the Spirit of God rushes upon David. God fills David with his spirit. You see, we talked about creation, like how we're meant to be, right? How we're created to be obedient, how to be worshipers of God. We talked about sin and the fall, how Saul did what he wanted to do, but didn't do what he didn't want. He selected and chose from what God had called him to, and he selected what he wanted to be obedient with and what he didn't. That's sin. That comes in and corrupts, and that's where Saul then had to pay the repercussions or the implications or the penalties of his sin. And then God points us forward in hope to a king that will redeem us. Just as the story is going to shift from Saul to David, God always reminds us that the story must always shift back to Jesus, that Jesus came and he entered into our story, our history, that he came and lived a sinless life, that he came and did all that we have called to. Not, he didn't choose and pick which ones he wanted to be obedient to and not. He came and was fully obedient to God. He lived our created design. He successfully navigated life without sin, and then he went and he paid a penalty for you and I. He died on a cross for you, for me, taking the penalty of death. But as Jesus was laid in the ground and covered our sin, he also resurrected from the grave, that he has overcome this world, that he has overcome death, that everything that can happen to us in this life, he has overcome. And that as Jesus ascended back to heaven, that he pours out his spirit on us, that that the spirit of God can rush upon you and me because of Christ, we can be reconciled to God, our sin forgiven, our hearts made new. Doesn't matter what we look like or where we come from. Doesn't matter how much money we have or how smart we are. It matters that our heart is given to Christ. That in that we find redemption, that we are drawn back into relationship with God. And more, more, it doesn't just stop there. That's the problem in the church today. We just think, oh, my sins are forgiven, I'm going to go to heaven, it's all good. Yeah, but no, that God's Spirit himself would fill us and empower us to live this life. Death never scared me, hell never scared me. It was when I came to the place where how am I going to get through this life that I reached out to Jesus? How am I going to live tomorrow? I've made such a mess of my life, how am I going to live tomorrow? Because it was this answer. It was that spirit of God rushing upon us. And that's for you. That's for me. It was for David. And if you think back to the story of Saul, when Samuel anoints Saul, it says the spirit of God rushed upon him too. God gave Saul everything he needed to be the king of Israel, to be a successful king of Israel. And again, we're not talking as Saul a believer going to heaven or a Saul not a believer going to hell. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being faithful to God as believers, you, me. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you, you can be. You've heard the gospel. You've heard the love of God. You've heard the hope. You can follow Jesus. You can make Jesus Lord of your life. But then, back to the conversation. Will we be obedient to our Lord, to our Savior, to our God, to Jesus? Or will we live this life like so many, choosing from which things God says that we want to obey? Ultimately, what we're doing is choosing to be God ourselves, God of our own lives. God says, I will take David. He's a man after my own heart. I know he's just a kid, but he's faithful. He's obedient. 
and I'm going to place my spirit in him, and I'm going to cause him to be king. Church, today, we have that opportunity to be all that God has created us to be, to live the life God has created for us. We've been given his spirit through the gospel. Will we submit and be obedient? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. You are our hope. It's not David, it's not Saul, it's not President Biden, it's not President Trump, it's not the next president. It's you. You are the king who will never fail us. You are the only leader who will never let us down. And so, Jesus, we cling to you for hope. Teach us to be obedient. Teach us to be submitted to your spirit. Teach us to have hearts that are only given to you. Help cleanse our hearts of things, anything, that is not completely given over to you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.